all my slides are up here. They are. Okay, sounds good. So I am going to start. Um, I'm going to be presenting the uh, carotid endarterectomy today for the neuroanesthesia rounds. Um, so I've been asked to present this topic with regards to um, pre-op uh, uh, assessment, anesthetic goals and management, um, as well as uh, post-op kind of anesthetic goals and concerns. Um, so I'll kind of be following that format as I um, present this today. I'm also sitting in the library at University Hospital, so if the printer goes off, just turn the volume up on your presentation because it'll get loud for a second. Um, so, uh, right, these slides are working. So, um, I figured we'd start off with kind of the pathophysiology and, and just a, a really brief kind of review of why we bother doing carotid endarterectomies in the first place. Um, so essentially it comes down to atherosclerosis. Uh, so that is the, the main pathophysiology of carotid stenosis is atherosclerotic disease of the uh, internal um, car carotid artery. And, and it often actually involves the bifurcation of the common carotid artery with extension either into the internal or external carotid arteries. For whatever reason, I've mostly seen um, the internal carotid arteries being operated on. Um, I thought I would put in a little table on kind of risk factors for stroke down here on the right hand side. Um, there are the obvious uh, modifiable risk factors that we kind of talk about every single day. So smoking, diabetes, um, atherosclerotic carotid artery disease, AFib, heart failure, and then there's the inheritable risk factors as well. So age, prior history of stroke, family history of stroke, black race, male gender, sickle cell disease. Um, and then just a quick review on the anatomy of, of the cerebral circulation um, and uh, um, and where kind of we're working over here. Um, so the clinical manifestation of carotid artery disease, so carotid artery stenosis, uh, it's a spectrum of conditions. It doesn't uh, always manifest as the exact same thing. So it can be anything from non-debilitating strokes, TIAs, amaurosis, fugax, uh, or asymptomatic brewy, all the way up to either debilitating strokes um, or less debilitating strokes secondary to cerebral infarction. Um, the sequelae of having carotid artery stenosis um, are often embolism of thrombus or arthromatous debris um, or a reduction in blood flow. So either embolic disease or um, poor perfusion leading to stroke or any one of these sort of conditions on the spectrum of stroke. So stroke itself, just a quick review again, is either ischemic or hemorrhagic. 83% um, of them are ischemic, so either thrombotic or embolic, and a much smaller percentage of them um, are uh, hemorrhagic. Um, about 7.6% of ischemic strokes will result in death within 30 days of initial evaluation, which is a pretty big number. Um, extracranial atherosclerotic disease accounts for up to 20% of all ischemic strokes. Um, less than 20% of strokes were actually preceded by a TIA. Um, so you may not necessarily have prodromal symptoms or prodromal TIAs to indicate that there is significant uh, cerebral disease, fast cerebrovascular disease. Uh, the annual incidence of stroke is actually likely increasing just due to our aging population. Um, and the incidence of perioperative stroke in the general population is 0.1%. Uh, in patients with asymptomatic carotid bruise is 1%. Um, and with patients that have at least 50% carotid stenosis is actually 3.6%. So things to look out for even when we're doing non-carotid endarterectomy surgeries in our patients with, um, uh, with comorbidities like carotid stenosis. So what are the indications for endarterectomy? Um, in centers of excellence, endarterectomies have actually become low-risk procedures with fairly good long-term results. There have been a lot of studies um, looking at uh, indications uh, for endarterectomies. Um, there's uh, probably everybody knows the nascent trials, the North American Symptomatic Carotid Endarterectomy Trial. Um, 
uh, as well as the European carotid surgery trial done in the 1990s. Um, and they reported uh, excellent results with high-grade carotid stenosis. So the nascent trial actually followed up patients at two years and looked at a stroke rate, at the stroke rate rather, and found that the stroke rate was 9% in the surgical group. So the surgical group were those managed with carotid endarterectomy and aspirin versus those that were just medically managed, so aspirin alone. Um, and the stroke rates were 9% versus 26% respectively. The European carotid surgery trial looked at the same outcomes, so stroke rate in the surgical uh, arm versus the medical treatment arm alone, and they're 2.8% in the surgical arm plus aspirin versus 16.8% for aspirin alone. Um, so the, the long-term, long-ish term follow-up uh, from these trials was significant enough um, to suggest that carotid endarterectomies in high grade uh, carotid stenosis um, uh, is worthwhile doing, is a worthwhile endeavor undertaking. Um, and then there's the question of doing carotid endarterectomies in asymptomatic patients. So your symptomatic patients are fairly straightforward. Anyone who's had a TA or amaurosis fugax, um, and has a high grade stenosis, uh, we now know, you know, over 70% is a number that we should uh, theoretically operate on. Um, but with asymptomatic patients, I think it's a little bit harder to make that decision. So there have been a, a number of five ran of randomized control trials, sorry, but we're looking at five of them here that are kind of considered the, the trials that kind of guide what we do. So there's the Casanova study, um, where they said that endarterectomy was not indicated for asymptomatic patients with a stenosis between 50 and 90 percent. Um, from my reading, I understand the Casanova study had a lot of issues, and so it's not really very highly regarded uh, in terms of um, decisions made based on it. Um, there was the Mayo asymptomatic carotid endarterectomy study. Um, this was uh, abandoned early because of an increased number of MIs and TIAs in the surgical group. Um, there was a Department of Veterans Affairs trial um, that looked at endarterectomy and aspirin versus aspirin alone in asymptomatic males with 50% or more stenosis. Um, and it found that there was a significant reduction in ipsilateral neurological events in the surgical group versus the medical group, but that the combined incidence of stroke and death wasn't any different. There's the asymptomatic carotid, studies, uh, st carotid stenosis study, the ACAS study, that looked at asymptomatic patients who had 60% stenosis or more, and they were treated with surgery and aspirin and, and were found to have a reduced five-year risk for ipsilateral stroke versus the aspirin group alone. Um, the improvement in outcomes didn't reach significance until years after the surgery, so that's important to note. All of these random samples were arrows in my original PowerPoint presentation for anyone who's watching this and wondering what the heck is going on. It's more of a flow chart. Um, and then there was the European Asymptomatic Carotid Surgery Trial, which essentially has replicated the ACAS results, um, but they came up with a 70% cutoff for uh, carotid stenosis in asymptomatic patients, which is where I think a lot of our current patient population is uh, determined from. So preoperative assessment into the meat of what we're here to talk about. Um, I'm not going to go over kind of like the, the normal things that we look for in our preoperative assessment, you know, making sure we work hard with the airway, IV sites, and all the rest of that, specific to carotid endarterectomies. Um, so there's, there, there is something that complicates assessment with carotid endarterectomies because the evidence supports that intervention within two weeks for patients with manifestation of symptoms is, uh, is the standard to go by. So there's actually a very limited time for optimization. Um, so things that you need to take a look at and, and make sure is done is optimizing their medical management. So make sure, making sure that they are beta blocked if that's indicated um, and that they take their beta blockers on the day of their surgery, um, that they are on a statin for their atherosclerotic disease um, and that that's taken on the day um, and that they are on an antiplatelet agent and that the antiplatelet agent is con continued throughout the perioperative period. The other important thing in these patients is to manage any pre-existing hypertension. So in an ideal world, you get a patient with really, really well-controlled blood pressure, um, but often I think we'll all find that that doesn't usually happen. Um, so initiating a gradual decrease in blood pressure prior to surgery will actually help with 
um, their intravascular volume, as well as helping with resetting cerebral auto regulation to a normal range. Um, oftentimes, this might require an internal medicine consult, especially if you have time to try and organize these things ahead of time. Uh, in the same vein, if your patient has poorly controlled diabetes, which is not out of the realm of possibility given this patient population, um, that's enough to try and help control. So, uh, you know, getting internal medicine to see them again, um, to see uh, if uh, new therapies can be initiated, um, and also uh, making sure that there's a plan for their um, their diabetes medications uh, on the night before and the morning of their surgery. And that's all very dependent on what medications they might may or may not be on. Uh, and then coronary artery disease been in this patient population, as I'm sure, is not surprising anybody. Um, there's not much evidence to suggest that routine investigation holds any benefit in this patient population, but the indication for any investigations you might undertake are unstable angina, um, patients had a recent MI with evidence of ongoing ischemia, any compensated heart failure or significant valvular disease. So basically the same things that you would investigate in any patient for any procedure if not that time. Um, but if you have a high index of suspicion that someone has coronary artery disease but they are asymptomatic from it, there is, there's nothing to suggest in the evidence that sending them for an angiogram is going to change anything, essentially. Uh, Preoperative assessment. You should continue all their long-term cardiac medications, including the day of their surgery, and aspirin should be continued throughout the perioperative period. Uh, discontinuous aspiration may actually be of aspiration of aspirin may actually be related, related to an increased rate of MI and TIA in patients that are undergoing carotid and endarterectomy. The other thing that we often see in the center is patients will come in on Plavix, um, so multiple antiplatelet agents, and we continue to go through the perioperative period also. Anesthetic goals. So these are, this is a very list form of what our goals are for patients with carotid and our direct. So to protect the heart and the brain from ischemic injury, to control the heart rate and the arterial blood pressure according to the surgery that we're at, uh, to ablate pain and the stress response in order to prevent labile hemodynamics, and to facilitate rapid wakefulness for neurologic examination at the conclusion of our surgery. Um, and what we do in terms of giving a patient an anesthetic should be directed by these goals here. So monitors for carotid endorectomy, in addition to the usual things, we should have five leads uh, on our ECG and have continuous leads to V5 for detection of any rhythm disturbances or ST segment changes. Um, Intraarterial blood pressure monitoring is the standard, um, and doing this with the patient awake pre induction um, is the way to go. And you should have non invasive blood pressure cuff on also in the contralateral, contralateral arm. Uh, central venous catheter and uh, Pulmonary artery catheters are very rarely indicated. You might might see an indication for them in patients that are having or have had a recent MI or are having ongoing ischemia that need urgent surgery. But for very obvious anatomical reasons, uh, stay away from the internal jugular uh, veins. Uh, try and use the subclavian or the femoral vein um, to avoid unintentional accidental puncture of the carotid artery. And with regards to general anesthesia, so the teaching is to try and avoid sedatives because you want to assess their neurological function at the end of this case, so long-acting things like midazolam. Um, and it really, really doesn't matter how you give them the anesthetic, just as long as you give it to them in a way that, that manages your goals, essentially. So um, often the use, the the use of titrated doses of opioids as well as titrated doses of propofol and a neuromuscular blocker, blockade um, is what we use. You can use Atomidate in patients with limited cardiac reserve, although I've never seen anybody here use it. Um, consider the use of upfront beta blockers um, to, I should say, to blunt hemodynamic response to laryngoscopy. Um, 
so uh, they're not getting large increases in their heart rate or their blood pressure with laryngoscopy. Um, and in patients with poorly controlled hypertension, or hypertension again, they're often deplete uh, from an intravascular point of view. Um, and these patients will likely experience significant hypotension with induction. So keep that in mind uh, with regards to using uh, vein pressors on induction. So shortening drugs like phenylephrine, which is what we use all the time. Um, but if you're on your own or very concerned that there might be significant hypotension with induction, consider running uh, an infusion um, to free up your hands to manage other things. So the use of volatile, uh, according to Miller, there are fewer EEG changes during carotid uh, occlusion to carotid clamping with isoflurane versus halothane and enflurane. Um, and sevoflurane has a similar profile to, to isoflurane. So um, it, it's been found to have a similar regional cerebral blood flow as iso, isoflurane or preserve regional cerebral blood flow similarly to the way that it is done by isoflurane and facilitates more rapid emergence than isoflurane does. Um, and then maintenance is is essentially down to whatever you'd like to use. There doesn't seem to be very much evidence um, suggesting that the use of remifentanil with a volatile changes outcomes in any way. Um, but we know from practical practical use that um, you know if we're attempting a rapid emergence, that it definitely helps us with that. Um, so you can do any number of things essentially to maintain your anesthetic um, as long as you are helping uh, you with your hemodynamic goals, which I'm going to get into right now. Um, so your blood pressure from a hemodynamic perspective should be maintained in the high normal range throughout and especially during, during carotid clamping, which is spelled very incorrectly. Um, so in cases like that, you might want to use short-acting vasopressors, again, as an infusion uh, to prevent the dips that you get as your pressors wear off. Um, and in patients that have contralateral internal carotid artery occlusion or st severe stenosis, um, you actually want to induce hypertension 10 to 20 percent above the baseline is what's advocated for uh, the cerebral perfusion. Uh, surgical manipulation of the carotid sinus can often activate baroreceptor reflexes and result in abrupt bradycardia and hypotension. Um, when this happens, your first step should be to ask the surgeons to stop. Um, they should have stopped on their own if they heard the heart rate slow down. Um, and they can infiltrate lidocaine to prevent further episodes. Um, it, the routine infiltration of lidocaine uh, does not seem to be um, advocated in any of the textbooks I was reading through. Um, but bearing in mind that once you've infiltrated lidocaine, this can actually increase the incidence of intra or post-op hypertension afterwards because now you've blunted that baroreceptor reflex. Uh, emergence, last part of this, is that it should be fast. Uh, it m might and often is associated with marked hypertension and tachycardia, um, which requires aggressive pharmacologic intervention. Um, so there's studies that have looked at um, patients who have had an MI on emergence after carotid endarterectomies uh, were pretty much uniformly found to have had systolic blood pressures that were over 200 millimeters of mercury. Um, so very important to, um, to manage blood pressure. So as much as you want the blood pressure to be very, very high uh, during carotid occlusion, um, conversely, you want to aggressively lower it um, on emergence uh, and after the carotid clamp is off. So that's general anesthesia. Then there's the regional perspective. Um, a lot of what I'm going to say is what I know from reading because I've never actually done this under regional technique. Um, so if anyone has any um, words of wisdom to add after, after watching this, please, I would love to learn. Um, so you can do this with a cervical plexus block, either superficial, intermediate, or deep. Uh, it'll block C2 to C4 dermatomes. Um, but this can equally be done through local infiltration at the incision site. So the incidence of serious complications for cervical plexus block is infrequent, although near toxic levels of local anesthetic have been found in almost half the patients that have superficial and deep cervical plexus blocks. Um, the pros of this are that it allows continuous neurological assessment to the awake patient. That's your best monitor is your awake patient. Um, it reduces the need for carotid shunting 
Uh, there's greater stability of blood pressure and decreased vasopressor requirements because we're not hitting them with propofol and volatile anesthetic. Uh, and there's reduced operative bleeding. The cons for this are patient cooperation is, is really important. So if you have patient panic or loss of cooperation, um, you can really get into trouble. Um, patients can have seizures or loss of consciousness with carotid clamping, um, which is problematic because you have inadequate access to the airway if you need to convert to a general anesthetic during the procedure under regional or local anesthetic. Um, so which is better? Which should we do? What? Why do we do what we do? Um, so there's been uh, a study, the GALA trial, um, it, that was done between 1999 and 2007. So it was a multi-center randomized control trial that looked at um, outcomes in patients who were given a general anesthetic for their carotid endarterectomies and patients that were given a regional uh, block anesthetic for their endarterectomy. Um, and patients were randomly assigned to, to either, um, either arm. Um, the primary outcome was perioperative death, uh, MI, stroke, including retinal in infarction. And essentially, it was found that the anesthetic technique was not associated with any significant difference in the composite endpoint. The secondary outcomes were duration of surgery, duration of ICU stay, length of hospital stay, quality of life one month post-op. And again, there was no significant difference seen between the two um, anesthetic techniques. Um, other outcomes that they looked at were essentially also the same, and these other outcomes were things like cranial nerve injury, wound hematoma, and chest infection. Um, the only significant difference that they found, or the only uh, finding of significance that was found, was um, that 4.4% of patients in the local anesthetic group, which was mostly cervical plexus block, um, had complications that led to surgery cancellation or conversion to general anesthetic. So something to note. I'm just going to do a really quick note on carbon dioxide management and glucose management. So should we control ventilation and CO2 during a general anesthetic for carotid endarterectomies? Um, there's this thing called a steel phenomenon where hypercapnia might shunt blood away from your hypoperfuse territories um, that have dilated vasculature. Um, so the idea is that you keep them hypocapnic uh, to reverse the steel phenomenon. Um, I think it's all very theoretical because there doesn't seem to be very, very much evidence to suggest that actually doing that, so controlled hypocapnia, will reverse the steel phenomenon. So I think that the, the teaching is generally to maintain normal capnia as much as you can and that there's no benefit in hypocapnia. Um, and hyperglycemia, this is, again, I'm not telling anybody anything that they don't know already, but uh, hyperglycemia can lead to ischemic injury to neural tissue. So um, this, there's uh, been studies that have shown that an operative day blood sugar of greater than 200 milligrams per deciliter has been associated with an increased risk of perioperative stroke or TIA, MI, and death. Um, so pretty important to manage um, patients who are wildly hyperglycemic on the day of their surgery. And again, if you're going to be treating these patients, your awake art line is key to get um, a baseline blood sugar and then, you know, repeated frequent monitoring intraoperatively um, if you have given them insulin. Uh, what do we do in terms of extra monitors for neurologic monitoring? So I'm not going to go very deep into this, but I will kind of go over the main kind of extra monitors that we talk about. So there's the carotid artery stump pressure. And the stump pressure actually represents the back pressure that results from collateral flow through the circle of Willis via the contralateral carotid artery and then the big vertebral basilar system that is the bottom part of the circle of Willis diagram. Um, it, you can use that to make a decision on whether or not you want to, or the surgeon can use that to make a decision whether or not they want to put a carotid shunt in. Um, if they're truly worried about poor uh, contralateral flow um, or uh, just just general bad flow to the brain, essentially. And I think they, the numbers I read were somewhere between 40 and 45 millimeters of mercury. But again, I could be wrong on that. Um, you can measure regional cerebral blood flow. I learned this last night. 
Um, so you can give either IV or ipsilateral carotid artery injection of radioactive xenon and then do an analysis of the decay curves from sensors that are placed over the ipsilateral, ipsilateral cortex that is supplied by the, um, the MCA. Ever seen it being done? I'm sure it gets done somewhere. Um, EEG, so clinical usefulness, I think of EEG is pretty limited by a lot of factors. There's a lot of false negatives. It may not detect subcortical infarcts. Um, it's not specific for ischemia and it's affected by a lot of things that happen under general anesthetic. Um, so um, temperature, hypothermia will uh, affect it. Um, low blood pressure will affect it and the anesthetic depth will affect it also. Um, and I don't know if it's entirely useful in this context because most strokes after carotid endarterectomy are thought to be uh, thromboembolic and will occur postoperatively. So I'm not sure how much an EEG will add to that. Um, you can do somatosensory evoked potentials. I am not the expert on this, so I will not talk about it. Other neurologic monitoring is something like a transcranial Doppler ultrasound or cerebral oxygenation. So through a jugular bulb, um, jugular bulb of the venous, mon venous system um, or NIRS, which is what we use here. So uh, infrared uh, spectrometry to look at cerebral oxygenation. So that's all of our pre-op considerations and our anesthetic goals and how to get through an anesthetic. And then there's our post-operative considerations. So carotid endarterectomies are, are pretty tenuous on emergence and post-operatively as well. So causes of neurological complications in these surgeries are intraoperative embolization, hypoperfusion during carotid clamping and post-operative embolization or thrombosis from the endarterectomy. So debris having broken off and causing, uh, causing uh, a stroke. Um, other complications that can occur are things like an intracerebral hemorrhage and cerebral hyperperfusion. And the two things are often linked. Um, most cerebral, intracerebral hemorrhages will occur one to five days postoperatively. And these are associated with significant morbidity and mortality. Uh, and with regards to hypertension and, and um, post-operative post hypertension, the theory is that the surgical denervation of the carotid sinus bearer receptors, and so you end up with this wild kind of blood pressure swing in the opposite direction. Post-operative cerebral hypoperfusion is an abrupt increase in blood flow that happens with the loss of autoregulation in a surgically reperfused brain. It's essentially a reperfusion injury. Um, clinical signs of it would be headache, seizure, focal neurological signs, cerebral edema, possible intracerebral hemorrhage. Risk factors for this are severe postoperative hypertension, and um, which is why I harped on so much about aggressive blood pressure management on emergence, um, and severe preoperative uh, internal carotid artery stenosis. So the greater the stenosis, the larger the amount of reperfusion, the higher the chances of having uh, cerebral hyperperfusion syndrome afterwards. Um, and then I thought I would touch very quickly on another like feared anesthetic um, or another feared complication, especially by anesthesia, which is the wound hematoma. Most wound hematomas are due to venous oozing and they respond well to external compression. Five to 10 minutes of external compression will take care of the problem. Uh, expanding hematomas require pre-evaluation at the bedside and really, really quick evacuation if there's any evidence of airway compromise. I've never been involved in a case that has had to go back to the OR for hematoma evacuation with airway compromise, but I have heard of a couple actually recently um, that uh, were apparently quite harrowing in terms of the airway compromise. So the risk of this might be mitigated by what we do post-operatively um, and on emergence, which is aggressive blood pressure control, essentially. Um, so um, I didn't really talk about it, but you know, your, your agents that you want to use for blood pressure control are short acting, easily titratable, um, and something you can control very easily. So your asmolol, labetalol, um, and uh, and you want to use it to to affect essentially and and to maintain a blood pressure that's not uh, swinging and uh, that is not very high. And that's really all I have to say. These are my references. I essentially used all of our textbooks um, as our as my sources.
And uh, I hope everyone has learned something new from a presentation on carotid endarterectomies. I know I now know everything about it. Thank you very much.